Okay. Good afternoon. I hope you are doing great. So please, everybody, um, take a look at the assessments. Go there in the assessments folder and see if you can find the uh, new assignment. Actually, I opened it a few uh, minutes ago and already one person submitted. Yeah, and the deadline for that is quite good. It's March 7th. And after 10, 12 days, we are going to have assignment number three. And the last assignment would happen one week before the final exam. So the deadline for them would be week number 11 and week number 13, 14 kind of thing. So because you have all the assignments, if you have time, uh, it's not compulsory. It's just uh, optional for your reading week. You can spend a good amount of time to just get these assignments uh, away from your, yeah. So just, you need to do it. So the sooner the better. Uh, these are all in the assignments folder. Apart from it, the in the course content, if you please go there, you see that there is the third last file, chapter 3A. IMDB. Please download that file and uh, bring it to your collab. If here is the collab, we go to the upload. Then just drag and drop your downloaded file. And you should be able to see something similar to this. And my suggestion is um, just quickly run the first 60 or 65 commands, and then we are going to continue right after that for today. Let me just wait. So you see it says that page 70, we still need to go further. So that's page 72, right there. So run all the way to page 72. And whenever you are done, please give me a signal. Yeah, it is 54, 55, done. I'm sorry to hear that, Prakash. Uh, I hope you get better soon. Thanks for letting me know. And I'm going to close my... The add class code is the second one for this time, for this class. If you joined from other section, the first one is for the morning. EVRL is for now. A6PQ is for the... Okay. So again, if you go to the course contents, there is one file. The name is chapter 3A IMDB. The only thing that you need to do is to drag and drop that file into Colab and run all the way to 
outputs number 54, 55. The thing that is mentioned in here, it says that the, uh, I read this, uh, let me just see if I can hide. Perfect. Give me a second. I don't know if uh, actually it works uh, whether I want it or not. So the thing is um, here it mentioned a deep stack of linear layer would still implement a linear operation. So it's not going to have non-linearity. One thing that it was in your quiz as well, is this part. It says that to access to a much richer hypothesis space that would benefit from deep representations, you need a non-linearity or activation function. So non-linearity is kind of synonym for activation functions means that if you have activation function, it provides for you non-linear process. And mention some of the examples like PRLU, LU, well, for sure RLU, leaky RLU, and so on. And the thing is, whenever we have binary classification like true, false, like positive, negative, cat, dog, for such cases, we want to have our probability to decide whether we say it is one or zero, whether we want to say it is cat or dog. For doing that, definitely we are gonna use a cross entropy, but a binary cross entropy is the one that we are gonna use for such cases to calculate the difference between where we are standing as the prediction that we have and where is the ground truth? And ground truth is, as you see here in the line, I just uh, used rectangle around it. So the ground truth is another word for label or the actual thing that we have. And the prediction is what your computer, what your deep learning is going to provide. Let's just read this one. It says that cross entropy is usually the best choice when you're dealing with the model that output probabilities, but it's not the only. Uh, it says that cross entropy is a quantity uh, from the field of information theory that measures the distance between the probability of distribution, or in this case, between the ground truth if it is positive, negative, and the amount of the level of the positive or negativeness in the message that you calculate. The next part, it says, to configure the parameter parameters of your optimizer, you can just have um, not pure optimizer RAMS prop. You can just pass uh, for this one. Um, Actually, this is the uh, rep uh, the deprecate version, the newer version. We need to use a full word instead of the abbreviation. And um, we just talked till, uh, I mean, this part. And uh, today we are gonna talk about validation and why we split the data into uh, three portions, testing, training, and validation. If anyone wants to step in, 
and contributes, feel free. If you want to read yourself for a few seconds, what is validation data set? And after a few seconds, I'm gonna just continue. Okay, let's read this one. It says that to monitor during the training the accuracy of the model on data it has never seen before, you'll create a validation. You'll, you'll create a validation set by setting apart 10,000 samples from the original training data. What does it mean? If you just have training data set, it's going to calculate it's going to provide a model that works with data in hand. So you go through 30 epochs, 20 epochs, and you get to an accuracy like 90%. But is that 90% a real number? Do you think that it is a real 90% accuracy? We don't know. How can we understand that if it is a real number? We can set aside Oh, uh, if you say, hey, after 30 bucks, so I'm going to test my model with test data set. You're right. But the problem is your model after 30 bucks shows 95% accuracy with data in hand, while it shows 70% accuracy with unseen data. Then what should we do? Should we just always check our model after finishing all the epochs? That's the problem. So the best solution could happen at the end of each epoch, you measure the performance of the model and see how good your model works, how good it is. That is why we have validation. And if you see here, we said out of 25,000 samples that we have for training, let's put it aside uh, the first 10,000 from zero to all the way to 9,999 for the validation and the rest means from 10,000 all the way to the end. We keep that part for the train. So 10,000, 10K for validation, 15K for training. Um, I have provided something here, everybody, if you uh, want to see, if you go to the there is one note file. Before I get any further, just spend one, two minutes, read the program, see what is happening here. It talks about the, it talks about the custom loss function, something that we quickly passed. The gist of the article is, it is possible to create your own loss function while at the same time, if you're, 
data set is one of the classicals, we already have loss function for them. So you just need to search, not to create from the scratch. So we split the data into 10,000, 15,000 for the training data. How about the label? We do the same thing. The first 10,000 labels are for the Y validation labels and the 15K for the Y validation, uh, sorry, for the Y training data set. The model that you see here is pretty, pretty similar to what we did before. We have the model that fits and it's gonna be the X train and Y train and the number of epochs and batch size. And the last part would say X validation and Y validation. And this is something that we didn't have before. Let's read this part. It says that at the same time, you'll monitor loss and accuracy on 10,000 samples that you set apart. You don't, I'm uh, sorry, you do so by passing the validation data as the validation data argument, as you see in the last part. So getting back to the cola. We just got to this part that the optimizer, and then we said first 10,000 and the rest for training, the same for labels. And this is going to look at this one because it's not gonna pause. We have Malik, we have those, um, accuracy and so on in the middle, and we have the validation accuracy at the end of the column. Does that make sense? What does it mean? Do you see that these numbers are changing, but that number is fixed? What does it mean? Why the numbers in the middle are different, but the numbers in the last part are fixed? Any idea? You said that? Sorry? Accuracy of what? Okay, here we have training accuracy. And in every batch in the epoch, you just adjust it. What is the batch size? 512, what's the overall number that we have? 15,000 for training. So if you divide it, you are gonna see how many batches we have, right? Very simple, 15,000 almost, guys, 15,000. Look at this one. If I say we have 15,000, and then I divide it by 512. You see that it's 29 point something. Look at here. It says that how many batches? 30. So it should round, round up because we are going to have 29, 50, 512, and the remainder in the last batch. Does that make sense? Okay. So in Every one of those batch that we have in 30, we pick the number of accuracy. And we say the accuracy for the first batch was this, for the second batch was this, for the third batch was this. And finally, we are going to calculate the overall accuracy of that batch, uh, that epoch, sorry. 30, 
30 different batch accuracies. We calculate the average here is going to be this one. But why we have just one validation accuracy? Can anybody understand that and explain? Why we have only one validation accuracy? Okay, there are two things I want to tell you, and I told to the other classes as well. Let me just be very clear. Guys, last year, this time, I made everybody to do research and do stuff, and just I was a bad person because I made everybody study. Right now, I'm just relaxed because those people turned back to me saying that Reza, why we cannot find job. Uh, I can show you, unfortunately, I can't show you the name, but the amount of things. Guys, if you think that after finishing this, there is a red carpet and a web designer would get a six-figure job, this will be your future. So I'm going to just say it and record it, and I do the job that I do. But if you just want to sit in a class to get one mark for the lab exercise? Yes. What is the validation? Why validation is just once, but we have 30 different accuracy during in each epoch. And this is just a very simple question that if you read, if you just skim the book, you could be, you could be able to answer it. I repeat it for the last time, why we have 30 different accuracies and we calculate the average and we have only one accuracy in each line without any average. Because the validation were supposed not to be part of the training process. We said that validation should not be part of the training. We put it aside. We create our model based on the training data set, 15,000. You make your model based on that 15,000. You make your model, finally you just check it with validation. That is why validation gives you one answer because the model is already created. You put the data, you get the output, you compare and see how good your model is. Does that make sense? You don't do any back propagation. You don't do anything here. You just do all the process in this part. Okay, we go through all these processes and you see after 20 epoch, we get to something like 99.93. In the previous session, it was 99.98, almost 100% accuracy. But it shows that we have 86 for unseen data. Which one is more reliable, this 99 or 86? 99, sure. But 99 for data in hand, not for unseen data. What is, I repeat my question, which one is closer to real accuracy? The one that, yes. The, Awesome, yeah. Look at here, guys. Here we had 85, and you remember I said why the first time, always the first time, the validation accuracy is super higher than the training accuracy. You remember why? Lovely. Nash, awesome. Look. At the beginning, if I just show you, <clears throat> this, instead of having 784 for MNIST, this time our IMDB has 10,000 columns inputs. You remember that. And then all of these weights and biases are either so weights are randomly assigned and biases are started from zero. And you get dismal 
very random outputs. For the case that it is true, false, it is positive, negative, what do you think? What is the chance of getting a correct answer? And that's not a trick question, very simple. Guys, imagine that they say, um, guess what? Did I get a job or not? What is your chance to guess a correct answer? 50%, right? Like head and tail. That is why, that is why at the beginning we have that 50% chance, but we try to correct it. Imagine that the first epoch, the first batch, we were just close to 50%. Then we did back propagation. We made it a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better. But because we had 30, 30 batches in the first epoch, look at this. This is the average of almost 50% all the way to the last, which was 80, for instance, 3, 4%. The average was this one. But when you created the model, you do not need to start from a thinner. You already have something. So that is why the accuracy is 85 there. Does that make sense? So you don't start from the scratch. Your model is already built. You check the accuracy of the built model with your validation. That's why always validation has higher accuracy in the first attempt. Look at the next one. We have a little bit of progress, a huge jump from the first to the second. That always happens. And here, guys, do we have any progress from epoch three to four? Yes or no? Yeah, still we have. How about this one? Yes, we have a tiny, teeny, but how about from this to this? No. So what do you think? Maybe your, uh, because of the randomness of the computers, maybe your answer is slightly different. But what is the best epoch to stop and say, okay, if I go further, I just increase the accuracy for data in hand. That's not what we are looking for. We want to make a model realistically close to the correct, to provide correct answers for unseen data. So the rest would be wasting your energy and time, right? You might need to visualize it. So please just run this part. Whenever you have any, e yes, please. The accuracy gets lower after a certain point. Why do you draw in five periods of box? I'm not sure. That's a correct, uh, that's a valid question. I'm going to answer that when we see the visualization, okay? Less than three minutes. Every, every single, every single fit that you run creates one object that is history. And that has a member history and that history member, member of the object has four keys. Let's just, see what are the keys. One is loss for the training. One is the accuracy for the training. The other one, the other ones are validation loss and validation accuracies. Does that make sense? Okay. Let's just, draw a plot. And in that one first, I'm gonna just draw a loss for validation as well as the training. Look at the output. Now this can answer your question. You see here in the first epoch, the, and if you see the legend, it shows that this is for the training. Our training was totally off from the, right? So we had a huge loss, but the validation was quite reasonably lower. In the second, we almost have, in the second epoch, we almost have overlap. And a slightly, we have better result in uh, the training data set. But James, look at here, we go closer and closer to zero loss, right? We get closer and closer to zero loss. 
for 20 epochs, right? But look at this part. The validation data shows that in epoch number one, not that bad. Epoch number two, way better. Epoch number three, still better. Uh, this is epoch number three. And epoch number four is the best, but after that we are going to get worse. We do not know when we are gonna switch to that. We need to run it. And then from now on we decide, okay, four is the best number of epochs. Because before that, how could we be sure that it's it's gonna happen in epoch number four or epoch number 10, right? Yes. Uh huh. If that one would have went down all the way to like zero point one in loss. Um, why that happens? Why that kind of pickup happens? Right. Your question is something like, oh, like that. If there was a lower, a lower loss. Uh huh. We are gonna continue. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's, there's one thing, William, that people um, get confused. And the question is, uh, when, which part we say we have uh, overfitting? Do you have any idea when overfitting happens in here? Uh, James, do you see any overfitting pattern here? When overfitting happens? That is something, guys, if you just look at this uh, once forever, you're going to understand it. Look at this one. The time that, the time that your training data shows better performance compared to, compared to unseen data. This is overfitting. This is something that, um, Lucas read the book as well and asked me one of the problems that you can see in this chapter is this one. It says that we stop when we have overfitting guys. We have overfitting in epoch number three. We do not stop there. We continue as long as we can get better results. Still, still unseen data shows better results in epoch number four. Yeah, the overfitting is bigger. But we stop continuing when the results for the for the validation data get worse. We say that, okay, stop it there. Because your model is going to work the best with the data in hand, but not with unseen data. That is the part that you have to. So if the question in MCQ, that's one of the things that I always like to ask because actually a person like the author of the book even did mistake for that. Said that we have to pause when overfitting happens. No, we have to keep moving till the time that it works worse on the unseen data. Does that make sense? The funny thing is it mentioned in a wrong words, but it did in a right way. So that was the confusing part. Anyway, we do the same thing for the, look at the next. We do the same thing for, okay. Yep, there we go. We do the same thing for the accuracy. My apologies. Um, that was the problem of the book and I corrected in some of the places. And I have forgotten to correct it everywhere. So technically, this is the true label. Just give me a second. I'm sorry. It bugs me. I can't. Yeah, now the labels. Uh, the book has that problem. It's in page 75. Uh, please correct it. It should be accuracy, not. So control S, now saved. Uh, my apologies. Give me a second. I want to overwrite.
Okay. What can you understand from this one? And I'm sure if you run the program, yours could be a slightly different. We try to get to 100% accuracy. Those dots show the accuracy that we gain from the training data. But here you see epoch number one, two, uh, three, four. Let's just see that it's a little bit better here. But after that, it's going to decrease the accuracy. You see that? So which epoch is the best to start for my uh, sample epoch number four? Maybe I saw in the previous uh, session, some people found six, some people found four, some people found five. It could be different. So spend a few seconds, just compare your graph with your neighbors if they have done as well. See what you can understand. Write for yourself just a quick note. It should be, but um, that is 20 just then. Ridiculous. Okay. Okay. So you got it, right? We we see that we get to a perfect result using the training data. And you can say after a certain epoch, you're gonna learn something that are specific for your data in hand. In other words, if you saw it in the book, it says we learn some patterns that they are not general. Again, I repeat it. In book it said you learn some patterns that you are not general and you are very much specific to, to your data that you have in hand. So that is why the more that you proceed, the less general accuracy you could gain. By saying that, let's go to the book. So it says that, note that the call to model.fit returns a history object. That's what I told you. And history object um, has a member called history. Do you remember that you had history.history? .history? And that one contains four elements, the accuracy and loss for your training and the accuracy and loss for your validation. And um, uh, some of the missing parts in here, but the code that you have works. Actually, I always check my code before coming to the class. And last night, 12 a.m., the code didn't work. Something was changing in Keras. I, I freaked out and I realized that what was the change. Anyway, so the code that you have is the latest version. It works fine. And you see here, I said change it to accuracy. Okay, getting to page 76. It says that, as you can see, the training loss decreases with every epoch and the training accuracy increases. That's what you would expect when running gradient descent optimization because the gradient descent optimization responsibility is to find lower loss value. I repeat it. That's the job of gradient descent optimization to find lower loss values. 
But let's see, the quantity you are trying to minimize should be less with every iteration. But that isn't the case for validation on scene data. That isn't the case for validation of loss and accuracy. They seem to pick at the fourth epoch, similar to my model. This is an example that we want to, we sorry, we warned against earlier. A model that performs better on the training data isn't necessarily a model that was the best in quiz. A model that performs better on training data. It's not necessarily a model that works better with unseen data, right? This is the prime example of overfitting. It says that in this case, to prevent overfitting, we could stop training after three or four epochs, right? James, that's what you asked. Now, because we see and we can just understand where we pick. Yeah. So before we get any further, it says that for further experiments, what we need to do, and actually I tried several things, and I want you to uh, guys, I have provided some stuff for you, but let me just tell you a fact for those who like to seriously continue deep learning before of uh, this like three, four months ago, we could easily work with Colab without any fear. So they were kind enough to give us good amount of RAM, good GPU and so on. Actually, it's like they made us addicted to the environment. Now they limited all the resources and said, uh, you know what, from now on you have to pay. And I had a tough time, I remember, that I used for these values, the activations, I used 1,000, 1,000, and it worked like Mercedes. Right now, even with three levels, 10, 10, 10, it says that, sorry, insufficient RAM. So actually I'm searching for a solution because I want to set up a kind of workstation. And I'm thinking about all the possible, like making a cluster of even raspberry pies, because some of my friends did, to make something a local Jupyter notebook. Okay? But if you just want to get a good grasp and you're not sure about the future, and guys, I'm experimenting. If I get any result, even if the semester is over, I'm going to just share it in the group saying that, hey, this is the best configuration that they found for having your own local um, Jupyter notebook. Apart from it, if you see here for page 76, I have tried several architects, uh, architectures, sorry, um, like, like saying two hidden layers, um, like, sorry, three hidden layers, like four hidden layers, uh, if you see, instead of using Ram's prop, I change it to Adam. It was it was before Ram's prop. Also, instead of using binary cost entropy, I used mean square error. Huh? I tried all those things, and I want you. It's really worth. Uh, so let's just make it like a, an open lab. So please just uh, let's spend 10, 12 minutes. You can come and go, just do the experiment, and then we are going to continue until one o'clock. Just a second, sorry. OK. Um, the question that I received was, um, OK, why we have always one for the last layer, right? The question. 
Uh, the answer to that question is, what is the data set? What is it doing? It tries to say if a review is positive or not positive. So we have one neurons at the end. If it is zero, it shows that it is negative. If it is one, it shows that it is positive. Does that make sense? But because we don't have any, <clears throat> because we don't have any absolute positive or absolute negative, we need to make make up our mind. For instance, if if something is, let me just show it here. If something is, imagine that here we have zero and here we have one. If something is uh, above 50%, like here, we say that belongs to positive. If it is here, positive. Here, even if that's the threshold, we can have a tie break saying that even we consider these guys positive too. But anything below that, we say that they are negative zeros, right? What can provide such a thing for us? Sigmoid. So any range in here, it's going to bring us to one. Anything below that brings us to zero. Does that make sense? So that is why your question here first, we have positive, negative one neurons. And for the last, we are going to use sigmoid because we want to decide if it is above that or below that. Okay. So right now, I just try this one. And it is kind enough to accept. You see, we started from very low, like almost 50%. Uh, sorry, uh, 5, 0 0.5. And the accuracy was um, 78 uh, my apologies, I just uh, confused myself with accuracy and loss. So the loss was quite high. And in the second epoch, we drastically changed that. And the accuracy had a kind of big jump from 78 to 90%. Guys, do you see that? We just, instead of using two layers, we added one more layer. My suggestion is if you want to try such a thing, not a bad idea to use it like the previous example, split it into validation and training and see how it works in every epoch in terms of unseen data. And look at the last one. Always it gives me RAM error. Let's see. I'm talking about this. Imagine that I have just only five, 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 but it starts working, almost at the end, it's going to crash. So the accuracy is 67, then 93, then 94. Oh, this time it didn't. Wow, surprise. Um, So the good thing is I just added one more layer, but the accuracy drastically changed. The number of neurons were smaller. My question for you, how could you make sure that this guy is better than the question that actually James asked differently? This guy is better than using this architecture, like 16 and 16. <clears throat> How could you make sure that this one is better than the previous one? In chapter four, we are gonna compare different validation sets and training sets. <clears throat> and we see if we drastically increase the number of neurons or layers, it is going to get to perfect answer quite fast. But the same way, we are going to get to overfitting very fast as well. 
what can we do? And it's mentioned in many part of the book. And you're gonna see it in different articles, the main enemy, the main problem in convolution or neural nets is overfitting. What are the strategies that we can use in order to lower down the overfitting or make it smoother? One of them is lowering down the number of layers, lowering down the number of neurons in each layer. That's one way. It's going to slow down the process. It takes more time, more epochs, but the good thing is it's going to be slower and smoothly changes. Yes? Weight regulation is another one. The other approach, actually, I didn't want to address, we, we learn all of these like weight regulations, um, lowering down the number of layers and neurons. And the other one is something funny that uh, Dr. Jeffrey Hinton um, suggested and it worked pretty fine. And that was, uh, he said, he went to one of the branches of the bank that he always worked with and he saw that the teller that he used to work with uh, is not there anymore. And asked the manager why once in a while the tellers change in the branches. And the manager explained, we do not want to keep all the staff permanently in one branch because a conspiracy could happen. It means they're gonna just, um, if they want, they have more knowledge about the clients and they can misuse their knowledge. Like, okay, I know that Mustafizur is now on a trip. So what if I just get the uh, money from the account of Mustafizur and put it in my account and get the interest of that? I'm just saying some, some examples. So for protecting the system from that kind of conspiracy and misusing the system, they randomly take those people from and it's exactly what happens in one of the, the strategies um dr hinton said based on that i started applying zero out means that out of the samples that you have you're gonna for instance you say that i want to take 50 percent of the neurons out randomly so you can just apply 20%, 25%, 50%. That's another strategy, but let's just wait to get to that part. It already said, uh, you use two hidden layers, try to use different, like increase the number of layers, increase the number of neurons or make it fewer. And it says that for the loss function or cost function, we use binary cross entropy. What if we use MSE, mean square error. What if um, instead of sigmoid, uh, sorry, instead of rel, we use sigmoid, we use 10H. And what is the difference between 10H and sigmoid? Can anybody search and tell me what is the difference between, you see the shapes are the same, but what are the differences? Difference between 10H and sigmoid. Uh-huh. 10H goes all the way to negative one, while sigmoid goes to, okay. So we have one to negative one kind of thing for 10H, while for sigmoid it is zero to one, right? There is one thing that makes made, actually we changed it, made uh, 10H more desirable we had zero as the center part of the function. That was something that they, they very much liked it. So in sigmoid, we do not have that center point. It is 0 0.5, it's not like zero, right? Anyway, let's go to the next part. It says that, um, let's wrap up the example. It says you usually need to 
do quite a bit of um, pre-processing. Actually, we have done that pre-processing. How did we do that? You remember I showed you this example. There are, and it mentioned that the way that we did was just one of the approaches. Let me just read it. It says that a bit of pre-processing on raw data in order to be able to fit it as tensors into neural networks. Sequence of words can be encoded as binary vectors, but this is just one of the ways that we can encode state. Um, you remember in the previous session, we saw this. We said that the review that we have contains lots of numbers. What if you say instead of 200, sorry, instead of 784, we have, for instance, 500 words. Let's pick the first 500 words and your review has 450. You are gonna use zeros, zero padding for the rest. That's one of the solutions, right, William? So instead of using 500, we say that if your review contains 450, let's do zero padding. If the next has 350, let's use 150 zero padding. Does that make sense? And if you don't know anything like this one, just use exclamation, uh, question mark for that. The other things, it says, uh, stacks of dense layers with ReLU activation can solve a wide range of problems. So it's less headache for us. Mostly we use ReLU for intermediary or hidden layers. In a binary classification, problem when we have two outputs. Technically, we don't have two outputs. Some people say whenever you have just one output, we call it binary classification, like cat or not cat, not cat or dog. Some people very much insist. And in here, actually, we have one output, positive or not positive. We don't have three, or like positive, neutral, negative. We have positive, not positive. OK, your network should end with a dense layer with one unit. That was a question that I think William asked, right? But why the last layer, we have just one. It says that in a binary classification problem, means two outputs, your network should end with a dense layer with one unit. There was a, a sum and there was the... Uh, well, it's the other way around. We should say that if we have multiple labels, then we use softmax, like what we had in MNIST, you remember that, right? Uh, good question. Yeah. What is what is softmax compared to sigmoid? Sigmoid, we saw that it's going to squash the range. It says that squash the range into zero or one. So the output of your network should be a scalar between zero and one, encoding probability. And the last thing, um, this is something that I very much liked. Well, binary cross entropy for uh, loss function, but it says the RAMS prop optimizer is generally a good, it's a good enough choice, uh, whatever your problem is. So that is one less thing for you to worry about. Longer story short, guys, don't hesitate to use RAMS. And the last thing is, it says, be sure to always monitor performance on data that is outside of the training set. What does it mean? If I want to have one question, one MCQ question from this page, this one would be the one, the question. Guys, be sure to always monitor performance on data that is outside of the training set addresses using test data set, train data set, validation, cross entropy, which one? Cross entropy, A, B, C, or D? How many say training, A? How many say testing, B? How many say validation? 
And the correct answer is validation. Because it says that be sure to always monitor performance. Guys, if it says that, check the performance at the end. Yes, testing. Check the performance at the end. But continuous monitoring happens when you have epoch and you check in every single epoch. It's a continuous monitoring validation, right? So by saying that, we get to the beginning of the next big example. That's another hello world example that we deal with. And that is nothing but Reuters, a data set which they covered, they, they collected from the Reuters news wires in 1986. We are gonna come back in 10 minutes and continue our journey here. Let me just pause it now. Okay, um, now we start a brand, brand new example. And that is a multi-class classification example. What is the meaning of multi-class? Means we do not have only like binary classification, true, false, zero, one, cat, dog. We have more than two. And is it a single label or multi-label classification? Look at this one. It says that the Reuters, this example, the previous section, um, you saw how to classify vector inputs into two mutually exclusive classes using a densely connected neural network. But what happened when you have more than two classes? It says that in this chapter, we try to classify Reuters news wires into 46 mutually exclusive topics. Because you have many classes, this problem is an instance of multi-class classification. You don't have just two. And because each data point should be classified into only one label means that you can't say that news partially is financial news, partially sport, like Chelsea's stock was sold in the market overpriced. I'm just fabricating. So partially it is a sport, partially it is financial, partially it's stock, right? You're not going to put several labels. You have to decide which category it belongs to. So that is why we say it is a single label multi-class classification. If each data point could belong to multiple categories, you would be facing a multi-label, multi-class classification problem. Can anybody tell just one example of multi-label, multi-class classification? And you have used it and you use it every day. Sorry? Fashion is still, we have one label at a time. We don't have for instance, t-shirt and shoes in one picture, right? Example. Uh, pardon me. That's perfect. That's one example. Actually, title generation is one of the applications that we already have. So, it tries to analyze the picture and finds that, for instance, we have a mountain there, we have a tree and the, the leaves are um, green. So we can say spring in mountain. So we define and that's label generation for the um, photos is one of the hot topics. The other thing that we every day, we use it is tagging the photos in Facebook or Instagram. So one photo, a family photo, a collective photo could contain many of your friends or your family members, you tag all of them. So it's multi-class, multi-label, right? Okay. The Reuters is a data set they collected in 1986. And the overall data set contains almost 8,000 some hundred 
samples. And one, uh, the thing is, it's not a balanced data set means for some of the um, classes, we have lots of examples, but at least we have 10 example for every single sample. If we had just equally 10 samples, the overall number of samples should be 460 because we have 400, sorry, we have 46 classes. So you see that it's a kind of unbalanced data set. And uh, if you can, if you can just click on this, if not, let me just open. Look at this one, uh, I hardly could find, but finally I found these are the classes of Reuters. So like coca, grain, vegetable oil, urn, and so on and so forth. These are the 46 classes of the Reuters news. Getting back to the, if you go down into your uh, course content, you can see the second last file is Reuters version two. So please download that and upload that one. So everything is done, means there is no error compatible with the recent version. Uh, where to find that? Here, Reuters in the course content, the second last. And you should see something similar to this. One of the things that we start the chapter with, saying one hot encoded. What is one hot encoded? Okay, search a little bit. What is one hot encoded before we... Yes, one hot encoded or categorical. Like what? Can you give an example? Yes, William. It's just for formatting categorical data. Formatting categorical data, but how? Okay, just look at this example, everyone. Imagine that you have numbers like one, two, three. Huh? If you have numbers like one, two, three, that's one type of representation. If you choose to use this form, remember you have to use a sparse categorical cross entropy for the loss function. I repeat it. If you decide to use integers like this, one, two, three, you need to use categorical cross entropy, sparse categorical cross entropy. But instead of saying one, you could say one, zero, zero. Instead of saying two, you could say zero for one, one for two, zero for three. Does that make sense? For three, you could say 
zero for one, zero for two, and one for three. Does that make sense? This is, sorry? There was a three class classification for four spots. And... Lovely, yeah. William, for the example that we are dealing, imagine that we have 46 classes. And imagine that the news that we, we try to classify, it belongs to class number three. So you're going to say zero, index zero is zero, index one is zero, index two is zero, but index three is one and the rest would be zero as well. Does that make sense? You're going to have 46 columns. All of them are zeros, but index number three. If you, if you grab that, explain it to your neighbors and see if still you have any confusion, any problems. Okay, done. Done. Okay, because we talked about this cross entropy and categorical cross entropy and these kind of architectures that we might deal with, I want you please open another collab. Please open another collab. Go to upload. Go to upload. And if if you want, that's the shortest way to grab this one. You see that here we have assignments. Also, I have defined assignments number two. And you can click and find the files. Look at this one. If you download the files, you should have something similar to I'm sorry, um, assignments, assignment number two, yeah. So drag and drop this part, the interactive Python Jupyter notebook into here. And click on this folder, click on this one. I just intentionally, I want to make sure that everybody can follow that and drag and drop the iris and don't worry about the warning that it says because every time that you lose that and you start, you're gonna just drag and drop the, the same file, huh? And say, okay. And look at the things that it asked you, the major challenge at the beginning that we have is till this moment, we just loaded our predefined data sets. This time is the first time that in, in these examples that we load from an external source like Iris. You see that? And we just, it's a kind of a step by step thing. And you're gonna see categorical, for example, some of the things that we have learned till this moment, how to use one hot train labels. I want you please spend um, 10, 15 minutes right now before I continue Reuters, because when you see these content, and then when I start working on, guys, uh, this iris, is it binary classification or what? Yes, because we have Setosa, versicolor and virginica it is not two so it is pretty close to the concept that now we are dealing with and actually with the mnist data set that we worked with or fashion and mist so we have multi-class classification so please go through it
just to let you know, I'm going to take care of the attendance, but if anyone wants to leave the class, they all always um, yeah, more than welcome to join or to whenever they want to leave. But if anybody leaves before finishing of the class, it's not going to be one for the whole attendance, just to let you know. Thank 
Very active. Question: Why is there no marks on Hey, Okay, so uh, just a quick question: How was the how was the assignment in general? How are the questions? Well, people mostly say that it needs with the recording and upload. It takes something like two three hours. Yeah, so it's a reasonable mini assignment, not very sophisticated and uh, you have time my suggestion is because people might have other things to do in the midterm or before midterm and so on you already have assignment number three and four as well look at this one i just uploaded i just opened it this morning and already people submitted in here so not a bad idea just do it in advance and whenever i open the folder just get rid of this task one less task to do okay uh, let's go back to the we said hot encoded one hot encoded and uh, that is the category called cross entropy and we said if we use numbers, we are going to use okay. We said that if we use this category called cross entropy, we just in one hot encode it, and the other name for it is category call. This is kind of to go loss function. But if you use numbers, and that is something that Lucas actually shared with us a week ago, if you have numbers and you want to make it work, you need to 
use sparse categorical class entropy, right? By saying that, let's get back to the book. A uh, data set, we talked the categories, we talked, guys, do you see any similarities between what we have in here and the things that we had in the previous example? What do we have in similar? Yeah, well, that's, we have for all the, um, data sets, we split it into train data, train labels, test data, test labels. What else do we have here? We, well, we just use uh, the, yes, uh, Mik Mikita, you wanna say something? Okay, the top 10 most frequently used, top 10,000 most frequently used words, the same as what we had for IMDB, the same thing. And everybody, please try everything all the way to the beginning of page 79. Means simply just Import the data set Reuters and then check the length of it. Look at it. We have almost 9,000 samples for the train data. And look, we have almost 2,000, 2,200 almost for the test data. Right? And then if you check the first record, zero, it's gonna show you one, two, two, all the way to the end. Look at the length of the message. You see it is quite lengthy. If you check number one, you see that the length is a bit different. If you check number 10, that's funny. You just see it is less than a width of your monitor, right? If you check 100, it is quite lengthy news, right? So let's get back to zero because we want it and we work with it. So let's just say it is zero. And I want you to spend a few seconds with your friend. Say what is happening in this. I actually talked about it yesterday. I talked about it last week. And I want to make sure you know this very cell. Like the back of your hand. Because we are going to use it several times in different examples. Anyone wants to explain or give it a try? Pardon me? 
for uh, the exchange of position even value? Uh -huh. um, how about this? Let's just uh, start from here. We say that go and get the dictionary, right? We get that dictionary and we place that inside word index. And we say for every key value that we have in the word index items. Yes, so it is like, uh, I remember the first word, it was from something like that and then number. Now let's change it to number then from, does that make sense? So we do it like that. And then what is happening in here? Excellent. So you see, this is an example. Here we have zero for padding, one for start, number two. Number two for unknown, but instead of saying unknown, we are gonna just show question mark, huh? What else? So technically, whatever we have in the dictionary, we cannot start from zero. The indexes in the dictionary, originally they start from zero, right? But when we want, when we want to bring it here in this context, because we have zero padding, zero, index zero, we have a start index one. We have unknown index two means that everybody should shift towards right three seats. So if you want to bring it back to the original indexes that you have in your dictionary, the original dictionary, not in the review, you have to take those three seats back. Does that make sense, William? So this minus three talks about that. So we take everything back and now it's exactly, I, I don't want to yeah, overwhelm you by repeating that. It exactly shows from here that said as a result of its uh, December acquisition and so on and so forth. But the question is, we always had just only one question mark. Why we have three question marks in this very example? If anybody can answer that. Why we have three questions? Yes. Okay. That was section minus three, right? It has nothing to do with that part because it is minus, because before we had minus three and it shows just only one question, right? But it has to do with the we print the data. Okay. Look. I make it a smaller, you can see the sequence of the numbers that we have and you can see the results. So now you can judge. Yes. Uh, the first the second and the third will be the number one. Same for, for, for the So what's your number? 80. Sorry? 80. 86. Mean that, right? Yes. Bravo. Look at this one. Exactly the numbers that we had here, they are one, two, two, and the rest, right? If you say one minus three, what's gonna happen? Negative two. Do we have any negative two in the index of the dictionary? No. If you say two minus three, what's going to be the output? Minus one. Do we have any negative one? No, we don't have that in the dictionary. So for those unknown things that we do not have any equivalent number, what are we going to do? We're going to say question mark, right? Awesome. And these are the, if you say the train labels, it's going to show you number three, guys. What is number three in the labels? It's zero, I'm sorry. It's going to be, uh, I can't point it to the, it could be zero, one, two, and three. It's gonna be earn. Does that make sense? And then 
this is something that we used for vectorizing the sequence. You remember, if you have forgotten, let me just quickly, <coughs> my apologies. Let me quickly bring to jogger memory, final package. This is the example that I provided to ease the job and to ease the understanding of this. We said that, imagine that we have two sentences in the easiest, in the simplest format. We have two sentences. One contains three, seven, two, seven, for example. It's the second one contains this. So there are two samples. And then you remember we said, what is the length of that? Shoot, guys, uh, trust me, uh, it works, but I can't kick the uh, main. So it's going to show you two, and then yes. Uh, and if you say two and 10, it's going to make a matrix of zeros that has two rows and 10 columns. And this is exactly the same thing. We go to that specific place of, for instance, row number zero, index number three, go there and convert the value from zero to one, right? This is exactly what happens in this function. And we say vectorize sequence, we pass train data and test data. But The other thing that we said here, what, what is the role of this one? It is pretty close to what we did. Instead of 10,000, we have 46 classes this time. And we say the label that we get, look, the label could be zero, could be one, could be three, could be seven, could be 41. It could be between zero to 46, not including 46. What we do is we are going to get to every single label that we have, and we are going to change that specific column from zero to one, vectorizing. Remember this one? We get one and we convert it to one, zero, zero. That kind of thing happens in here. And it works for this and we call it one hot, uh, sorry, to one hot input. But remember, this is something that without knowing the concept, we did it in MNIST data sets. Do you see that guys, you remember that the first one's label was three. So it is zero, one, two, and three just converted to one and the rest would stay zero. It mentioned something, it mentioned that, hey, you don't need to worry about implementing that. Already, they have provided a function for us, and the name of that is two category calls, something that we use in our first example, MNIST. Look at the output, guys. What is the difference between the output of our handwritten function and this one? Can anybody find that? In this one, it clearly mentioned it is float 32. So you don't need to do any typecast. It clearly mentioned that it is float 32. Okay. Getting back to the book, it says that to vectorize the label, there are two possibilities. One is to use one hot encoding. Um, let me just, uh, I explained it um, two or three minutes ago, but let's emphasize on this paragraph. 
Look at this one. It says that to vectorize the labels, there are two possibilities. You can cast labels list as integers. In that case, what should we do? Just for the loss function, we have to use the sparse cross entropy. A category called cross entropy. But the other option is using one hot encoding, which is why we use um, for categorical data, also called categorical encoding, both. And this one is something that we explained a few seconds ago, but we showed you that this is something that we used for the MNIST. And it mentioned that. You remember in the MNIST example, we just used a category call. You need to import, but there's one thing. If you run this line of the code by book, it's not gonna work. They changed it and I freaked out last night. I don't know what happened again. Um, so they changed it to keras.utils import category call. There is no NumPy utils. Yeah. The code that you have is a corrected version. As you see. So building your network, it says that in a stack of dense layers like that you have been using, each layer can only access information presents in the output of the previous layer. So what does it mean? It means that if the first input layer contains 10,000, like the dictionary size that we see, possibilities, the next one, we say that it is 512. Both of them are fixed. This guy, the hidden layer 512, access the previous layer, which is 10,000. Question, what is the last layer's dimension? How many possibilities we have? Sorry? 46 problem. Another question. Is it logical if we keep some layers in the middle, like four, five, ten, way less than the other. Oh. Just think about it. Look at this. If one layer drops some information, means that in the middle you have just, for instance, four neurons, but at the end, you need to have 46. Um, some information relevant to classification problem, this information can never be recovered by later layers. It becomes the kind of bottleneck for the flow of the information. It says that each layer can potentially become an information bottleneck. Whatever you learn, just write one sentence out of it. So I want to write, it would be something like this. And why I emphasize, we are going to see pretty soon in the meter. The information bottleneck is nothing but having a drastic reduction in the number of neurons in one of the hidden layers in the middle. And when we say Jurassic, it means that if we have n and n is the number of neurons, it is way less than n. That kind of thing. Let me write it for people at home. It means that n is way less than n. N is the number of neurons in each hidden layer, and M is the number of classes or categories in the last layer. Okay. Look at this one. It says that the last layer uses a softmax activation. If it was, I told you a few seconds ago, 
or let me just show you in here. We said if the last layer contains just black and white, true, false, we use sigmoid. But what if we have something like 0, 1, 2, all the way to 9? We have different classes. Or like this example, we have 0 all the way to 45, totally 46 classes. Huh? What should we, sorry? We need to use softmax. We need to use softmax. But what is the role of softmax? Every single possibility, right? And you want to see which one has the highest possibility, and you are going to pick the maximum possibility among, among them all, right? I repeat it. The softmax responsibility is to find which one has the highest probability, and it's going to pick that argument. I intentionally use all these words like argument because you're going to see in a few seconds. Um, again, the last layer uses softmax activation. You saw this in uh, this pattern in the MNIST example. It means the network will output a probability distribution over the 46 different output classes. For every input sample, the network will produce a 46 dimensional output vector where output i is the probability that the sample belongs to class I. Hmm. What is the total number of, what is the sum, sum of probabilities in each sample? Just for my curiosity, do you read at the same time the book? Yeah, it's obvious. And there's a good news. Uh, for you and for those who read, because I uh, I told you that I don't worry about saying and even if just one or two people just pay attention. Uh, there's one class that they had and there were nine students. It was a kind of um, one of those credit courses, IOT programming. And I told about deep learning three, four weeks. And one person, who dedicated to study. He just got a job in deep learning four weeks of a study, but deep learning in deep learning. Let's go to this part. Categorical cross entropy, like MNIST. It measures the distance between two probabilities. What are those two probabilities? The actual label that they have and the possibility of happening that label. What does it mean? Let me just show you one example. What is the page? Sorry. H80. Okay. Imagine that the label that you have to come up with is three. And guys, what is what is the possibility of being labeled three? That's one hundred percent, right? But in your prediction, you say that, you know what? Label three has 96% chance. Overall, to be more accurate, this one is 1.0, and this one is 
0 0.96 means that the rest of the others, if you sum them up, they are 0 0.4. This one is 0 0.96. The loss calculates the distance between these two. Let's read it again. It says that categorical cross entropy measures the distance between two probability distributions. Here, between the probability distribution output by the network and the true distribution. Does that make sense? Between that 100%, it is label number three. But I calculated the chance is 0 0.94. So 4%. By minimizing the distance between these two distributions, you train the network to output some something as close as possible to the true labels. Okay. Right now, we know about validation. So page 80 and 81. Again, here, we are going to split the data. How many data, how, how many rows we have for the training? Sorry. Uh, in general, we have something close to 9,000. Lovely, yes. If you see here, when we say the length of the train data, it is 8,900 almost, right? So because we don't have huge data set, we are going to just take out 1,000 out of it. It's here. We pick 1,000 for the validation. And the rest of 8,000, almost 8,000, would be for training. And we do the same thing for the labels. Huh? And now it's the time to say, find patterns between X train and Y train means features and labels. The number of epochs would be 20. The batch size, every time pick 512 messages. And the validation data, X val and Y val, I pass those two. Okay. So everybody, you have the code. Please run the code. Please run the code. Oh, I'm sorry. It's here. Run the code all the way to I'm I'm starting from. Page 80, import models, layers, then 10,000 most frequently used shows itself in the first input layer, and then the rest. And look at what is happening. Again, here, do you see that numbers are changing in the middle? And why we have 16? Why we have 16? What is the number of epochs? Can anybody tell? Sorry, 20 epochs. What is the number of batch size? Sorry? Okay. And windows are, if I say it was 8,000 minus 7,900, what was the number? Let's say 42 divided by 5, 12. Look, it is 15 point something. We have to round it up. Means 15 times the batches of 512. The last one is going to be 200 something. Does that make sense? William, you don't look 
Sure. Get that part to the public uh, as well. I thought we were grabbing 1,000 samples, but it's. That is okay. Because that is already outside of the, I got what you are saying. That is outside the training set. These batches would be the numbers that we are gonna get from the, yeah, exactly. And what we do is for every 500 some numbers, we are gonna calculate the accuracy and loss. And then here we have the average of them, right? Let's see which smile is going to persist more. Okay, so the last one, why it happens just suddenly, like why it doesn't happen gradually, like let's just run it again. Look, in here, you see the numbers are just calculating, right? But it's super fast. You see that there are some, actually to tell you the truth, 16 numbers are calculated and then the average of those 16 numbers show up. But here at the end of each row, we have just one. And don't uh, confuse yourself with this huge accuracy. The reason for that is I just retrained the system with already. Yeah. So if I want to make it correct, I should get, okay. Yeah, just get the data set from the scratch. Look at this one, it starts from 49. It's literally awful. But after that, after almost 50%, we jump into 68. After that, we jump into 73. And hey, it is super high, it's 95%. But which number is more reliable? This one or this one? The training accuracy shows the real accuracy for the validation, which one? Well, the validation, but again, look at this trend. First it was 62, then 69, then 73. It went all the way to 82. And then what is the epoch number? 10. Guys, this is my computer and even between two different runs that they had one time the best was epoch number nine in my computer one time it was 11 it was 10 so based on the randomness of the prompters you can see the, the, the numbers you can just find your own uh, best epoch but the thing is for this one if i continue it is going to reduce the accuracy for the, and I want to address one thing that the book was not accurate in explaining. Actually, it explained wrongly, but it did correctly. I'm going to tell you what it is. And it's exactly about this point. So in epoch number nine, we had the best accuracy for validation data. But look, still we have progress in data in hand. Should we continue? Even if you get 100% accuracy divide, 100% accuracy, you already have the labels for them. What's the use of it? You should make a model that works the best with unseen data, and validation is here to take care of that. If you make this, Perfect, it's going to be perfect for data that you know already. But this one shows, okay, when should I stop? The rest is just wasting memory, wasting resources, and even exacerbate the results. It's going to make the results worse. Got it? 
So look, but the question that I received in this class as well at the beginning from James was this one, Reza, where should we stop? If you continue, you can see we have two things. We have validation and we have training. Training tries to get to zero loss, which is ideal, but not real. Look at this one. Here, one, actually one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You can see almost, almost in 10, we have the best actual result, the lowest possible point loss. After that, it's going to get worse and worse. As I said, the book said something wrong about this part. It says that overfitting happens after epoch number 10. Hey, come on. Even the book at the beginning and all the resources said, guys, whenever your result for data in hand is better than on seen data, you have overfitting. So where do we start having overfitting, guys? What is the best, what is the first epoch that we have overfitting in this example? Lovely. Here, here we have, here we have, look at the trend. If I go higher, this is totally off, way better in the validation. In this one, uh, very close. In this one, still close, but start overfitting in this epoch number four. Still, we have overfitting, more overfitting. But the model start getting better for real data, unseen data. It got worse. That is the part that you have to stop it. Not when you have overfitting. Does that make sense? And that is something that I very much like to ask. So please, even if you have book, open book, open chat GPT, open the real answer, that's what we discovered together. Please remember. Okay. And I didn't grab this one. I want you to spend a few seconds, a few minutes. That is one of the last challenges that we have in this chapter. What is happening in here? Let me ask you before you get to that part. If I just flip the coin for head and tail, 100 times, 100,000 times, large number of practices. What could be the percentage of the head and tail? 50-50, right? Good. For numbers, you remember, for integers, zero, hundreds, and digit illness. We said that we have equal number of samples for each class, right? What could be the chance of getting into category number zero, category number one, and so on and so forth. 10%, right? So, guys, there is one thing. When the algorithm starts working better than the baseline, base random number, you say, hmm, it does something. I'm not saying ideal result. I'm saying that it starts doing something. Does that make sense? Again, I'm telling you, okay, guys, explain this one to your neighbors. What does Reza mean? Beautiful. 
Uh, we don't say best over fitting. We say that the amount of overfitting, there is no best. So overfitting actually, if you search in many articles, they say that's the mutual enemy in all deep learning models. And we try to lower down the overfitting. And there are some strategies. So that only just take the best one out. Okay, what does it mean in here? I repeat my example. So for something like 10 digits, we saw that 10% is the chance of each class of numbers. For this one, um, imagine that we have no algorithm. We randomly just, the labels that we have, we shuffle the labels. You see that? And then we just put them side by side. Look at the sample that I provided for you. Imagine that here, these are the actual labels that we have. Like 10, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 7, 2, 3, 6, right? I just shuffle the numbers. And now I have two, 10, four, three, five, seven, two, three, six, seven. Does that make sense? I randomly just change the order of labels. How many of them are now in a correct position? Only two out of 10. So can we say the result of this, the accuracy of this model is 20%? Does that make sense? The accuracy of this model, which was random, random, was 20%. Now let's look at this one, please. It says that let's have a copy of test labels somewhere. So it's test label cop copy. And I say that now shuffle the values inside that. It's like column number two. I shuffle the numbers. And now check the original test labels. How many of them? How many of them brought you the correct values? It's going to just sum them all. And we keep them inside that sum history because it's going to be lots of trues and falses, right? Lots of trues and falses. And if you say numpy.sum hits array, it's going to show you the overall number of correct trues because they're going to be one, falses will be zeros. Over the length of the, so for this one, it shows almost 19% was the, was the random generated algorithms results. You got it? In that case, anything above 19% means that it starts working, it does something. What is the accuracy that we have in our model? 80%, not that bad. Anything above that means that we, we are doing something, but the accuracy that we receive is 80%. And look at this one. If you just say predictions of the, the test data, I want you please, I want you please just go to this part. Also, um, sorry, before we get to that, let's just see what is happening in the accuracy. That's something that the book made mistakes several times. Um, let me show you the problem. It is here, it says loss while it is accuracy. So it's the amount of accuracy. In the... So somebody tell me, based on this, what could be the time that we have to stop training? Which epoch? Almost like eight in this example. How about how about my uh, result? I guess it is nine, right? Because after ten, we have a slightly kind of. 
decrease in the result, the accuracy. Hmm. So why it says that the sum of predictions for sample zero is one. And actually for me, it doesn't show one. It shows a number close to one most of the time. That would be funny if I tell you close to one and now it shows one. Let's just see. Excuse me. So, thank you. So, you see that, yeah, it says that now it is um, above. And the reason for that, guys, um, for rounding problems, because we have 46 numbers that sometimes you see it shows 0 0.999996. So, barely you can see exact one. Anyway, what does it mean the sum of prediction for predictions for zero is equal to one, almost one? What does it mean? Means that, what was the actual label for it? The actual label was number three. You remember, we checked the actual label. And it says that, hey, the chance of being zero is 0 0.001. The chance of being one was 0 0.02. But the chance of, for instance, three, it's 0 0.85. Long story short, 85 is quite a good number, great number. The rest of them, if you sum them up, they're going to be almost 15%. Does that make sense? So 15%, 85% total, it's going to just end up having almost 1%. Look at this one. But what is the what is the winner? Who is the sorry? Who is the winner? Who has the maximum value among those index number three? You got it? Index number three was the one who got 85%. Guys, SoftMax Max does this job for us. Finish. SoftMax is responsible to pick the maximum chance among all the possible chances. Right? And if you see the actual label and the argmax label, we were lucky. For this specific one, they were equal. 100% accuracy for the first. Okay. Do you remember that I mentioned what if you have 46 neurons as the output layer, but you just use something like, compare this one, I'm going to map. I'm gonna maximize the size. What is difference? What is what is a vivid difference between this one and the previous attempt that we had? The previous attempt was this one. Guys, here. This one, this model, and this one. What are the differences? Or what is the major difference between these two? It was six, it was sixty four before. Now it is four, and it is too small compared to this one. Definitely, you're gonna lose some data that you cannot retrieve it in 
future layers in layers that come after this. Look at the thing that Box said. It says that the only thing this approach would change is the choice of the loss function. If you do not use hot encoded or one hot encoded or categorical, if it is if the output are integer numbers, you have to use sparse categorical. That is something that Lucas said last week. And um, we mentioned earlier that because the final outputs are 46 dimensional, you should avoid intermediate layers with many fewer less and uh, fewer than 46 in a year. And that is what we call it bottleneck. Look at this one. So this drop is mostly due to the fact that you're trying to compress a lot of information. It happens and you can see almost like eight, nine percent we have reduction. Um, their accuracy was about 71. Let's look at mine. Yeah. I can't get anything better than 71. I'm talking about this. And if you see the accuracy with data in hand, still it is not that much great. It is 86. You remember we got to something like 95 before. So to wrap up the, let me just see if please try different possibilities. So you can just play around with increasing the number of layers, increasing the number of neurons, decreasing the number of neurons. But to wrap up the example, it says that if you're trying to classify data points among n classes, your network should end with a dense layer that has n output, obvious. And a single label, multi-class collapse, classification problem, that's what we used. For the last layer, you need to get the maximum value among all the possibilities, or something like argmax. This is this can happen using softmax activation when you have a probability distribution. The other thing is categorical cross entropy is almost always the loss function that we use if you use binary, you just use binary and categorical cross central. If you use one hot uh, encoding, uh, you use categorical cross central. If there are integers, sparse categorical cross central. It minimizes the distance between the probability distribution, distribution's output by the network and the true distribution means ground truth, actual y. This one, y prime, y. And the last thing is, if you need to classify data into a large number of categories, you should avoid creating information bottlenecks, means way fewer number of neurons in the middle layer. Information bottlenecks in your network due to the intermediate layers that are too small. It we should avoid we should avoid this when and the number of neurons in middle layers, hidden layers are way less than the number of output. Right? That is something. And if I can see. Okay, uh, I don't know if I uh, mentioned that. It was in page number uh, 77. And I, I very much like this one. It says that the RAMS prop optimizer is generally a good, good enough choice or whatever your uh, problem is, actually. That's one less thing for you to worry about. So, Although it mentioned the best would be using RAMS prop, 
not a bad idea to just try different uh, optimizers to see the results and compare it. By saying that, thank you very much. This is pretty much for today. Uh, you already know that next week, because of the family day, we don't have any class, right? In the lecture, but we are going to have our labs as usual, okay? So see you next lab. S19 is closed. Thank you.